So yeah. going back to the Great Recession, what followed the Great Recession? What it, the Great Depression? World War II. When all else fails, they take you to war. Well, I, I think I think there's a lot of truth in that. But you know, the interesting thing is in Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin has absolutely refused to comply with their wishes. And so, if you look carefully, if you just look at the New York Times' most recent article about the various. So it's stations in Ukraine that the CIA has used to conduct terrorist operations and so forth. He knows those things. He found the uh, various laboratories that we'd established for all sorts of sick, perverse experimentation on supposedly people for the purpose of doing something to the Slavic race. I have no idea. I mean, I've heard all sorts of allegations. I'm prepared to believe almost anything now. But the bottom line is he's not going to comply. He, he has no interest in a war with us. He has no interest in a war no. with Europe. So he's going to avoid it because he, his assumption, I think, behind the scenes, that he will never say publicly, is if he just waits long enough, we'll collapse on our own. Now, when you go to the Middle East, that's a different kettle of fish. And increasingly, all the neocons, while they still want to try and keep the war going in Ukraine, you know, say, send F-16s, this new man, Budinov, is going to launch long-range missiles at Russia to try and provoke them. But the real focus now is on the Middle East. And everybody looked at this and thought, well, this is a righteous response to a horrible attack on the 7th of October. Then after about 50 days, everybody said, wait a minute, what is this? What are we really witnessing? And now we know what it is, it has very little to do with the 7th of October. And I think a lot of people are raising questions, and I think justifiably, that how did this 7th October thing really happen? There were Israeli officers, people in the intelligence community that reported on exactly what was happening inside Gaza. And for whatever reasons, they were told, no, you're wrong. So now we're beginning to wonder what happened on 7th October. And we're watching this mass expulsion and killing operation. And we're told that this too is justified. And Americans don't really know what's going on. I mean, you and I both know that. They look at it, they're a little bewildered. And remember, they too have been absolutely brainwashed and conditioned to accept the mass death of Arabs. After all, they're Muslim Arabs. They're our enemy. When you and I know that the vast majority of these people have no interest whatsoever in harming us and are trying to survive one day to the next. But it doesn't matter. We're going to get a larger war in the region because the Israelis have had a lot of trouble in, uh, with Hamas. Hamas is not extinguished. It's not annihilated. They've turned north to Hezbollah and their best bet at this point is to widen the war because we're there. And I, I, will, I will be very surprised if over the next few months we don't see U.S. strike packages from the naval power or ashore with the Air Force flying over various parts of the Middle East destroying Israel's enemies. I think that's coming. And what everyone is missing is that for the first time, Islam is actually beginning to coalesce into an alliance. There, there, there is a feeling in the Islamic world that this is an existential war for them. Remember, Netanyahu said from the beginning, for us, this is existential. Well, he's now made it existential for Islam. And so it's really a Jewish war against the house of Islam. I don't know how that comes out, but I have a great deal of difficulty thinking that Israel is going to survive this intact. I think Netanyahu may go down in history as the man that destroyed the place. But it's too soon to say, but I think there's a good chance that we're going to see very serious fighting that will involve Turks and ultimately Iranians as well as Arabs. And everybody says, oh, no, that's impossible. Well, I was told in January of 2022 when I said the Russians would go into Ukraine, Oh, no, that's impossible. They'll never do that. That would be economically devastating for them. I'm hearing the same things about the Middle East. I think things have changed. The world has changed. And in, in the Middle East, everyone I know who travels there and visits with the elites and the ruling capitals all say the same thing. Everyone says, this is the end of Sykes-Picot. We will no longer tolerate this. But it's taking time. You know, it's sort of like washing glaciers finally move after thousands of years. But they'll move, and they crush everything beneath them when they do. I, th I think we're headed in that direction. The question is, what do we do? Our country is in trouble here at home. And, and then you hear somebody say, well, it's all China's fault. And I tried to tell people, you know, the Chinese didn't open our borders. The Chinese are, didn't open our ports. 
Now, maybe the fentanyl comes there, but it goes to Mexico and we let it in. And 110,000 people a year roughly are dying from it and no one seems terribly concerned. There's something wrong with this picture. How much money does do the cartels have that they can use for influence inside our government? I don't know, but I suspect there's a lot of money out there. Uh, you know, I, I just want to go back to the, the Israel. What, again, they're going to keep expanding it. There's no question about it. And uh, I mean, they're bombing bombs away over Lebanon now. They're hitting eastern Lebanon. And people don't, oh, the Hezbollah, they're, they're terrorists, militants. Oh, you mean the Hezbollah that drove Israel out of Lebanon? Why, how dare they do that, those militants? And I believe they're going to expand this. And that's what I'm saying. World War III is going to become official when there's a major event that happens. You go back to World War II. I tell people, Google up uh, FDR put sanctions on Japan. And what he did, again, history today, mainstream, in when did they bomb Pearl Harbor in December? In July of 1941, a couple of months earlier, FDR seized all Japanese assets in America. The United States, the UK, and the Dutch put sanctions on Japan that cut off three quarters of their global trade and 88% of their imported oil. They only import 100%. You know why? Those dirty Japs, they invaded French Indochina. Wait a minute. First of all, I'm an American. What do I care about that? And what are you talking about this French Indochina? You mean the French in, in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos stealing tin, rubber, and rape and pillage? That, what I'm saying is that when all else fails, that remember, this is the Great Depression, they take you to war. Can't but, understand why Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, how, how dare they? Well, there was something else that, that FDR did, and this really upset both the leadership of the United States Navy and Army at the time, and that was that he insisted that the fleet, the Pacific fleet, that normally after exercises returned to their, you know, home ports on the western coast, he said, no, keep the fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Well, immediately the chief of naval operations contacted the, the president and said, this is very dangerous. We could lose the fleet. You know, we don't know what will happen. I mean, they'd been practicing for years to deal with a Japanese attack, but they also knew there wasn't much they could do. They knew they couldn't rescue our soldiers who were on, uh, you know, Manila in the Philippines, couldn't do it. That's how we had 12,000 men fall into the hands of the Japanese in 1942. And at the same time, General uh, Marshall sat down with the uh, CNO and said, we've got to start planning because it's very hard to foresee a way out of this without a war. And you know the rest of the story. There were attempts by the Japanese right up until November to come to a, a conclusion, the last one, of course, uh, gave Roosevelt virtually everything he wanted. But thanks to Harry Dexter White, who was an NKVD agent working for Henry Morgenthau, uh, FDR was per persuaded not to do that because ultimately the, the principal beneficiary from a war between the United States and Japan was Stalin. So I think we're, we're dealing with potential Pearl Harbors now. We've yep. got Pearl Harbors all over the place, all over the Middle East, and we still have them on the edge of the war zone in Europe. And if this thing gets out of control in any of those areas, then you could have really devastating attacks against which we have very little to, to utilize. I mean, what do we got? Our armed forces are in ruins. I, people, if you, look at, if you look at Ukraine as an example of war today, we, we already lost the entire US Army plus over there in a real war. And yet we continue to threaten people. And of course, this also raises a specter of a nuclear exchange. Yep. And everybody tells me that, you know, although that's not going to happen. Well, I hope and pray that it doesn't. But let's not put ourselves in the position of failing and losing, whether it's in the Middle East or somewhere else and having to resort to something like that. So, yeah, again, I believe World War Three's begun and it's just going to become official when there's like a Pearl Harbor or something. Look what happened when they killed three Americans on the Jordanian uh, Syrian border. Again, which we have no right being in all these countries. 
Oh, all of a sudden, America's bombs away over Syria and Iraq. Three killed. Well, how many Palestinians got killed yesterday? Well, according to the UN, it's around over about 215 a day. But well, three Americans, and I'm saying there's going to be a full you know, flag of America. Those three Americans were reservists. Yeah. Really didn't know what the hell they were doing anyway. They were over there doing something because the army itself is too small. Uh, it's been too small for a long time. And everyone's upset over the loss of these three American lives, as you point out. But the question I asked at the time was, do we go to war over the loss of three American That's soldiers on foreign soil? And people said, well, we can't let this go. I said, wait a minute. You know, do you want to go to war? And of course, we're not prepared for a major war, Gerald. No. We are not. You know, they asked uh, a guy who knew a thing or two about the atom bomb, Einstein. You know, what kind of weapons will be used to fight the Third World War? He said, I don't know, but they'll be using sticks and stones to fight the fourth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He was right. D Douglas, thank you so much for being here. Everybody, really, where, where can people find out more about what you're what – we're... Well, I've uh, become part of a new organization called Our Country, Our Choice. You can uh -huh. find it at ourcountryourchoice.com, and you can see what we're about. We're trying very hard to unite uh, – Republicans and Democrats and others across party lines. Our view, and, and this is one of the things that members tell me all the time, we're up, we're closing in on a quarter of a million members. We've only been around for five months. Wow. And uh, several of them say, you know, we vote for the Democrats. We vote for the Republicans. We vote for various people. And we get the same outcome, election no after election. Nothing changes. And so these are the people that are joining. But I tell them it's not just, we're, we're not just uniting across party lines on specific issues. I mean, we are. But we want to do something. And one of the things that we've got to do is recruit people to go in and occupy, occupy the federal bureaucracy to fill the appointed and elected slots. And we've got to stop retreads from going back in. And that's what's happened over and over and over again. And that's my great fear, regardless of who ever is victorious in November, that we'll end up with more retreads and no change. And that could be disastrous. And in the worst imaginable way, as you know. That's terrific what you're doing. That's great. Now, where is it again? How could they go there? Just ourcountryourchoice.com. Just plug it in to your search engine. It'll take you to the website. Look at what we're doing. See what we're doing. See the presentations we made. And we're trying to build up a huge force of people across the country that are very networked. We have various concentrations we're trying to solidify at this point. We want to get millions involved. Because when the larger you are, the more impact, the greater the weight you have. People pay, begin to pay attention. I talked to a group the other day, and I said, and you'll remember this, Gerald. Obama decided he was going to bomb Syria. Do you remember that? I remember. And he, he was all set and prepared to do it. Everyone in Washington was celebrating, oh, we can't wait to bomb Syria because this is another larger expansion, and this will mean more money for all the wrong people and great power for us. Didn't work. It didn't work because people called in tens of thousands. The phones rang off the hooks. Email was clogged. You know, people said, no, we don't want this to happen. And so Obama walked out and instead of announcing it, he said, we're not going to do it. Turned around and walked away. And I keep telling them, you can scare these people. Oh, these yeah. are not courageous people. You got it. You know, they are not courageous and they're afraid, but you've got to demonstrate that you're serious. And you tell these people, I will never vote for you again. Yep. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. That gets people's attention. I agree 100 percent. You know, as I one of the Bronx things, you call these guys out man to man. They don't know whether to piss or shit. Yep. They're I, cowards. They remind, me, they remind me of the kids that, you know, used to take out uh, at recess and beat the crap out of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, these are little cowards, little Chucky Schumers, little Lindsey Grahams, dead in your face, M Mitch McConnell. These clowns telling us what to do. How dumb could you be? Uh, uh, Douglas, thank you so much for being here. Everybody really see all the interviews that he does with Judge Andrew Napolitano and others. He's brilliant. He's brilliant when it comes to these facts about what in the world is going on in the geopolitical edge and, and what we can do to change it. This guy knows the history. He's been there. He's done it. 
and he's giving you information that you're not getting anywhere else. Douglas, thank you so much. It's re I'm really, really uh, honored that you're on, and thank you all for what you're doing. Well, thanks, Joe. I look forward to seeing you again.